right. from the mob or anything. So. All right. Yes. Why don't we get started? Thanks for coming. Uh, I'll take care of a couple administrative matters first. Uh, welcome to another CVLS lunchtime seminar. It's great to have you. Our next seminar is on May 23rd. It's being given by Jerry Brown. Jerry's a uh, longtime volunteer of ours, a uh, litigator, and he's going to do a general seminar on contempt. So uh, civil contempt, criminal contempt, uh, indirect, direct uh, contempt, it'll be an interesting issue. So that's next month on May 23rd. Today, we will be talking about adoption. Um, and with me, I have uh, three people. Am I going to have three people today, right? Yes. Um, who are all experts in adoption because they are all the GALs uh, who get appointed in every adoption case. So we have to my left, Nancy Havlitzel, Jeannie Gillespie, and Sharice Hampton uh, on the far left. Um, two other GALs get appointed. There's five. The other two um, are Deanna Lopez and Ellen Douglas, and Ellen may be here at some point today, and if she does come in, she's probably just going to sit in the audience, but then when you have questions at the end, direct them always to Ellen. Yeah. <laughs> it'll, be, it'll be kind of fun. She'll wonder what's going on. Um, so we've broken this up a little bit into sections, and this is going to be a seminar on more of the how-to. Um, not that it's become difficult to do adoptions, but things have changed a bit over time. There's a lot of paperwork in adoptions. Um, there is a lot to the process of an adoption. If your adoption is ever contested, then you've added uh, even more difficulty to that case. But that's not what we're going to talk about much today. We're not going to get into contested adoptions. Generally speaking, CVLS takes uh, a lot of adoptions, and they are primarily related adoptions where the parents are either consenting or not in the picture and will most likely be defaulted based on grounds. That's a typical CVLS adoption. We also will do unrelated adoptions, um, but they will be somewhat similar in that we don't usually take them as contested. Um, and if there are parents uh, that we can find um, or not find, then we'll usually uh, terminate their rights based on grounds. Every once in a while, an adoption will go bad, as we say in the divorce business. Um, so you never really know where any case is going to go. Um, but today, we're going to discuss relatively uncontested adoptions and the process of them. I'm going to have these guys talk mostly, and I'll stop eventually. Um, but I kind of wanted to address, I think, a primary issue in every adoption. And it's the one substantive issue we're going to discuss a little bit today. Um, and you have to address this early on because it's going to impact how you proceed. And that's who are your defendants? Who are the parents of this child whose rights you are seeking to terminate? And that's not always an easy issue. Generally speaking, although you can often see some really <coughs> odd and unusual cases on mothers, um, but generally speaking, you know who biological mom is. And if biological mom is not a plaintiff or petitioner petitioning with a step parent to adopt, then you're going to be terminating biological mom's rights. And you have to identify her. And, and typically, that's not a difficult task. Moms are generally on the birth certificate. The difficult task is in identifying the father. And uh, rules have been put into place acknowledging the difficulty of identifying the father. But you must identify the father. And so there are three ways. And, and who you want to identify is a legal father, if there is one. Because if there's a legal father and you identify that person in the petition as the person whose rights should be terminated, then that's the only father you have to deal with. He's legal. I've identified him. Now he's either going to consent or I'm going to uh, file for grounds or on grounds and terminate his rights. But to be a legal father is, is not always easy to uh, figure or understand. So there's three ways to be a legal father. And that's to be married to the mother at the time of birth or conception. It's to have signed, if not that, to have signed a voluntary acknowledgement of paternity since 1996. For any child before, born before 1996, it doesn't work. But for any child born after 1996, if there's a voluntary acknowledgement of paternity, then he's the father. And signing a voluntary acknowledgement of paternity now puts you on the birth certificate that 
legally confirms and verifies your parentage. Pre-96, there was no voluntary acknowledgement of paternity. I could put the name of my next door neighbor on the birth certificate and nobody would care, and that, or on the uh, documents in the hospital, and the birth certificate would have that person's name on it, but it had no legal impact. Since 96, the only way to get on the birth certificate is signing the voluntary acknowledgement of paternity, and then a birth certificate does have legal impact. That's two. Three is uh, a parentage court order or some court order finding that person to be the legal father. And for children born before 96, then there's really those two ways, through marriage or through a parentage court order. If you don't have a legal father, then you have to acknowledge that in your pleading, and you have to say that although there's this person we all know to be the father, Bob, and you might identify Bob as being the biological father, you have to identify an unknown legal father. Serve him, impact, terminate his rights, um, and the alleged biological father. And then there's this whole requirement of checking to see if you don't have a legal father, if some man has signed up on what's called a putative father registry to identify himself as a possible legal father of that child. But we'll talk about that later. So the one substantive issue I wanted to bring up was the fact that when you do these adoptions, your purpose is to terminate the parental rights, but you got to first identify who your parents are. And once you have them identified, that's going to color how your petition for adoption uh, what it states, and it's going to color the process you take throughout uh, to address both a biological father and a legal father. Having said that, we're then going to break more into how to do these things, and we've broken it up into sections, and our first section is going to be about um, preparing to file, filing, and, and getting that first court date, and then our second section is going to be about what you're going to do at that first court date. Our third section is going to be about some post-filing or post, uh, they call that the initial presentation day, post-initial presentation day. And they will generally be working with the GAL and investigator in their roles. Um, and then um, jurisdictional and termination, uh, termination issues for your parents. And then fifth, which we may or may not get to, depending on how long this takes, um, would be motions and filing for entry of your judgment. And then because we're going to be quick and efficient to some extent, uh, we're hopefully going to have time at the end for some questions and then maybe to talk about some unique issues that pop up, especially for our cases. Um, so that's the introduction and we're going to start with the, the beginning of the case. Okay, so, uh, <laughs> um, so you get from CVLS, you get assigned a case, you get an intake form that tells you all about your client and the situation of the adoption. Um, presumably you've spoken with your client and filled in any blanks that you may have had or any questions that you had and you know what you're doing. You go to the wonderful forms that Phil's got up on the website so you can draft all your forms, right? Um, you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, but make sure, because every case is a little bit different, even, you know, the forms are a great starting point, but make sure that you actually read through the form to make sure it actually applies to the facts of your case. Don't, you know, um, the CVLS volunteers are wonderful, but we've had other people, you know, other attorneys that do other types of law that think, oh, it's an adoption, I can handle this easy. And they can find the form somewhere, they just turn them in without actually realizing that they don't apply to their specific facts. So make sure that you do mold the, the petitions um, to deal with your case. So um, I know Phil gave everybody uh, a copy of the standing order. The adoption court is very much a creature of statute and a creature of procedure. So even though it's, um, you know, dealing with the life of a child in custody, you know, and, and all that stuff, um, take a few minutes to flip through the statute a little bit. It's interesting reading. Some of it makes no sense at all, but, but it is what it is. Um, but definitely read through the standing order because this is the actual procedures for doing an adoption in Cook County, which is where I'm assuming you guys are doing your adoptions, and that's what we're talking about today. Um, when you're ready to file your case, bring your petition, as many copies as you think you're going to want for your file. For the um, child, you're going to have to serve a copy on any child under 14, so you want to bring an extra copy for them. Um, if you, or if you're going to be serving biological parents, you're going to need copies for them. So just sort of count through how many copies you think you're going to need. You need a civil divi a county division cover sheet when you file. You need a summons for any biological parents that you're going to be actually serving as opposed to publication. Um, and Nancy's going to talk more about that later, but um, 
you also need a summons for the child. Now, hopefully that's gonna change soon. We're working on legislation <laughs> that's working its way through the, the um, Illinois legislature right now to avoid having to serve kids anymore. Um, and But for now, you still have to serve the child. So you have to have a summons issued for them um, and original one copy. Uh, other than that, your other pleadings and stuff, you don't need to worry about when you actually go to court. You do need your civil legal services provider form so that you don't have to pay the $65 filing fee. SCLSP, as they call it here at CVLS. If everybody has taken a CVLS case or understands uh, the rights of civil legal service providers to waive fees for clients, that's how we do it. We don't have to file a petition with court to ask to waive court costs. We get to certify a client as being within 125 percent of the federal poverty level if in fact they are um, and then with that form when we go to file we just tender the form it's almost like a check and that's payment for your case um the other documents uh that's that's what that's the stuff that you need to file and you um the civil legal service provider form also in addition to working to waive the filing fee will also waive the fee that the sheriff charges the lovely 50 dollars fee that they charge to hand the child the documents at the counter in their office um, there are other things that we're going to talk about in a second, other documents you're going to need when you actually are ready to go to court, but for actually filing the case, those are the documents that you need to have with you. When you file the case, you're going to get assigned a case number, and you're going to get assigned a calendar. If you look at the first page of the administrative order, you'll see nice little handwritten uh, numbers, but each calendar corresponds to a judge and a specific day of the week that they sit. So when you get assigned your case, you're going to say, it's going to say calendar number seven. You're going to know that your case is assigned to Tuesdays. Now, it's not assigned to a specific Tuesday. You can go to court on any Tuesday you want and that your clients are available, but you're required to go on a Tuesday. The um, case number, the last digit of your case number, tells you who your guardian ad litem is going to be. And I don't know if you have that list. You know what? It's on there. Oh, it is um, on here. It's on page two. Oh, Sorry. And it's on there. It's on the same one. There you go. Um, to tell you how often I look at that. Because you read it once. Because I read it, it's all, all committed to memory, right. Um, uh -huh. Anyway, so you look at the last digit of your case number, that's how you know who your guardian ad litem is going to be. So when you, after you file your case and you go back to your office to draft the rest of your documents, including your interim order, then you know which guardian ad litem to assign as the guardian ad litem in your case based on this. And I don't know if it's actually in there, but there is also a sheet that has contact information for all the guardians ad litem. And all of us and the two that are not here are always happy to um, answer general questions about things if you can't get to fill or you can't, or if you've got concerns about your specific case, we're always happy to talk to you about them. Um, okay, so you filed your case, you know who your guardian is, you've talked to your clients, you've chosen a Tuesday to go to court. Um, when you're preparing your documents for court, the court date, in addition to the documents that you've already drafted, you need your interim order, which, uh, do you guys, have, you don't call them interim orders, you just call them orders, or? Do you maybe want to address why, why, why the, it may or may not be called an interim order? Sure, absolutely. Um, it, according to according to the statute, you're required to get an interim order within. I don't know if it has a specific time frame or it, the first document you're supposed to get entered by the court is an interim order, um, which gives which appoints a guardian ad litem. It will appoint an investigator, either the guardian ad litem if it's a related case or an outside agency. It will give um, care, custody, and control of the child and make the child a ward of the court so that the adoption can take place. You can only get an interim order, however, if you've already given notice to the biological parents. If you have unknown parents or parents where you don't know their whereabouts and you're going to publish notice to them, you can get your interim order even if the publication time hasn't run. If you are going to be serving a biological parent with, through the sheriff, um, you cannot get custody of that child because they don't have notice yet. You can do your initial presentation, but you're going to have to take that custody language out of your interim order. And I think when you were not here, which I guess you say that generally you just recommend that they don't use the custody language at all, ever, right? Uh, yeah, you know, every once in a while you will find uh, some of the five <laughs> adoption judges doing some unique uh, processes or systems or, or requirements, and, and we found that to be one of them. That some judges, if we name it interim order, but take out the custody provision because we don't have notice, they will not enter that because of the term interim. Other judges don't mind, but rather than create multiple orders for multiple judges, we decided to just remove interim from the term of the order and call it an order appointing GAL and investigator and leave it at that. The reason we don't always petition for custody or pursue custody at that initial presentation is that often in our case types, our client is either the guardian or has some other custodial right to this child 
or the parents are long gone and it's just not necessary. Um, so that's what we've done is just name this, order appointing guardian, uh, GAL and investigator, um, and not worry about the custody portion of that and get rid of the term interim. Does the court require you to do an interim order at some point in the future? Or no. just you just let it go completely? Correct. Okay, perfect. Great, all right, well that cleared that up. Um, in addition to your interim order or your order, appointing GAL that you're gonna bring to court that day, if you are um, going to be publishing notice, you have to do an order waiving the publication fee and, a, and a, both a motion and an order, although we were talking today actually about finding a way to streamline that. Um, additionally, if you've got petitioners who need to be fingerprinted, and um, we can talk more about that when we talk about the investigation, but if they need to get fingerprinted, you also want to do a motion and an order to waive the fee that the Office of Adoption and Child Custody Advocacy, or OWACA for short, um, charges. They charge a $50 fee if you don't get that fee waived. And that again is a completely separate motion and order that you need to bring in front of the judge um, when you do your initial presentment. And let me just jump in that those are unique to CVLS or any civil legal service provider um, because we're the ones that generally have the cases where we're seeking to waive fees. And so that CLSP that we can use to file and, and pay for filing and pay for the sheriff for service does not work for these other agencies or uh, uh, organizations and so the court has asked that we file a motion to waive those fees and enter a separate order waiving those fees um, and, and the only two that we have an ability to waive are the publication fee and the OACCA fee um, and not some other fees that you may find in adoption which are unwaivable um, so it's, it's generally only for a CVLS case and only for a client who's within that 125 percent of the federal poverty level we will have cases where clients are over that income level and then they're just going to have to pay all the fees. Um, okay, so when you are, uh, oh, and the other motion actually that you might bring is a motion to waive the background check. Um, occasionally, if you've got a guardian who was appointed within the last year or so, um, some of the judges are okay with waiving the background check. It's not a uh, guaranteed um, done deal ever. Additionally, if you've got a grandparent that's been raising the child for 10, 12 years, sometimes the court will waive the background check in those circumstances too, because again, it's as if they're with, they've been with a biological parent the whole time if they've been with them for 10 or 12 years. So again, it completely depends on the judge, and since the judge is randomly assigned to you, you're really just going to have to kind of talk to other people, talk to Phil, and he'll let you know whether it's worth even trying the motions to waive the background check. Because <laughs> yeah, they'll also do it sometimes if they didn't check. Oh, I'm sorry. Absolutely. If, if they work somewhere or um, have had a background check done, you know, in their uh, outside world, in their outside life in the last two years, you can usually get away for that and just present some sort of evidence of that. And where that comes up a lot in our cases is when the person is appointed as guardian in probate court, they have to do a criminal background check there. So if we are the guardian, we'll usually file to waive the criminal background check. I will tell you, though, that there's at least one judge now who's decided that because that is not a fingerprint <coughs> background check, that that's not good enough for right. her. So. Every, you know, it doesn't it's always work. Excuse me, you go like talking to each other, then you lower your voices. I'm sorry. You don't hear everything you're saying. I'm sorry. Do you want me to repeat what we were just talking about? I think I heard that part. Okay. okay. <laughs> if it was what Nancy said, then we, uh, Jeannie just talked about it. Okay. Um, so you have all your motions, you have all your paperwork and stuff. What you want to do just for your own, to make it easier for you, is have two separate files. One, for the judge, so you've got one copy of all of that stuff, your interim order, your any motions and orders that you have waiving anything. Um, put that together in one packet. You also need a case management order, which is the order that's going to set the date for your finalization of your judgment, or hopefully, as long as everything else gets done before that date. Um, the case management date, the court will not assign to you. You can pick whatever day you want, as long as it's, again, on the same date as your calendar. So if you're in on a Tuesday because you were assigned calendar 7, you want to, you know, Think about the things that have to get done in the meantime, and if you're serving anybody or publication, and then pick a date outside of, you know, what you think the default date, for example, would be on a publication, give it another week or two after that date on a Tuesday, and that will be your case management date. But you can pick whatever date you want. You do not have to, you don't have to wait for the judge to assign something to you. Um, so you've got one packet for the, um, for the judge, and then you want to have another, all of your extra copies, anything else that you actually want file stamped or entered by the clerk, you want a packet for them. So when you actually step up for the bench, to the bench, and actually, I got ahead of myself, sorry. When you get into the courtroom, there's a um, motion book at the front, up on the clerk's desk. You want to put the case number and your last name, not your client's names, because adoptions are supposed to be confidential. 
So you don't want your client's name on anything, although nobody actually sees that book anyway. But in any case, you want to put your last name and your case number on there. And that's how they call the cases. And you want to put it in the section in the middle of the page where it says initial presentments. The first section in the book is motions. So if you do happen to have a motion up on a case later on, you can sign it up there. And if you've got a biological parent coming into court to consent, the consents go on the bottom of the, sec of the um, page. But they're really, really well marked. And the clerks in that um, courtroom are very helpful. So if you get in there and you're not sure where to sign in the book, they will absolutely help you do that. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. Procedurally, yes, I will tell them. <laughs> Procedurally, if you are bringing in a biological parent to consent, you need to let the um, front office, Gloria Contreras, who's the adoption coordinator, you need to let her know the day before so that she can order a court reporter. Because all of, no, no adoption proceedings are on the record except for consents and trials. Um, and Gloria Contreras, also um, being the adoption coordinator, is one of the loveliest people you'll ever meet at the courthouse and is so helpful and um, so competent. So competent and yeah, I mean, can help you with anything. So if you do have questions or concerns or you're not sure that you're, you've got the right stuff with you or you're not doing anything. I'm sorry? Pretty flowers. Pretty flowers, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm just saying she's that important. Right. She's, yeah, she's she's just phenomenally helpful and she's a wonderful person. So. Is there a fee for the court report? No. No, the court reporters are, um, it's one of the, you know, court appointed reporters. Uh, we don't have to charge any fees, but it's sometimes difficult to get them because there's only one court reporter assigned to the whole county division. So uh, usually, again, if, as long as you give them 24 hours notice, you can usually get one there when you need them. Same with, if you're going to need an interpreter, make sure that you tell Gloria the day before as well. And she'll, you know, work really hard to do that as well. Um, if it's Spanish, it's pretty easy to get an interpreter. If it's another language, sometimes it's a little bit tougher. So you want to make sure that you give them as much notice as possible. So, so uh, let me ask you a quick question, Jeannie. So the, if you are aware of adoption or have done adoption, there was a standing order issued in uh, 2010. 2010. Um, the most 2010? recent one? No, 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 no. Oh, the, the original August, one? Judge McGill? August 2010, August, I think. August 2010, yes. Um, that was very procedural, um, almost. Uh, substantially oh, more <laughs> procedural it was probably like 20 pages um, and one of the big topics in there was what Jeannie's talking about right now filing and getting it set up for court um, and per that standing order which is deemed vacated mm -hmm. correct yeah it's officially vacated as of this. right by the new order um, there was a process after which uh, or after you filed where you would tender to Gloria the day before court or the day before you intended to go to court uh, your stamped copy of your petition for adoption and any stamped copy of a motion that you were filing and has that changed it we're has still not doing I actually that. yeah and yeah, i apologize for missing oh, that's that. okay yes you actually have to you can email it fax <coughs> it drop it off if you have to be in court but you have to get a courtesy copy of your petition to the um to gloria the day before so that the judge can read it before they get on the bench um, some of the judges if you forget for whatever reason some of the judges will let you go others will not they will make you wait till the end of the call so that they have time to read your petition so um and in fact some of the judges will read it and will have gloria call you with questions or or amendments to your petition before you come in um if there's anything that they're concerned about and it's an important issue because uh, some of them at times as well based on their calendar and schedule won't read it and won't do anything they'll ask you to come back so you really want to get that to Gloria the day before. It's it's very important. And and I ask this of you too because uh, very recently uh, Gloria has told us we don't need to submit motions, motions to waive. Um, and I haven't confirmed that yet. Are you aware of anything in that regard? Um, typically, if they are among the most routine motions like that, the judges are okay with you bringing them in. Um, one thing that Gloria, I did ask Gloria this morning, what if there was any specific issue I needed to convey to everybody? The court, other than routine motions, the court now wants all motions filed downstairs. Right. So, um, which is new, because it used to be that you could file, you could just bring your motion in, you know, in a folder, whatever, together, drop it off with Gloria, should get it to the judge, the clerks would file stamp it in the courtroom and then get it um, into the file. They won't do that anymore because too many things have been getting lost. So anything that's not a routine motion, um, and we can talk about routine motions in a second, but um, anything that's not a routine motion needs to be filed downstairs um, now the issue with that is you can't wait till the last minute because the clerk's offices have been having a lot of issues lately with getting things into the files 
So even if you file it downstairs, you're going to want to drop a courtesy copy off upstairs, or, you, or there's no guarantee the judge is going to see it. So a file stamped courtesy copy. Correct. So that they know you filed it. Correct. Correct. Um, okay, so you're ready. Uh, you're in court. You've got your family there. You, you, the child has been served, which is something you have to do before you go upstairs. You take the child um, to the sheriff's office, which is room 701 on the seventh floor. Um, it's counter service. They, it used to be the first counter when you first walked in. They recently moved it clear to the other end where they had the evictions. Um, and it's, you know, it's kind of amusing because you have to get, you know, kind of catch the eye of the sheriff as you're walking down because he's all the way over here and you need to be over here to get the child served. But anyway, um, they do counter service. They, you know, hand the child a copy of the petition and the summons and they give them a lovely junior deputy badge. So at least the kids under 10 think it's kind of cool stuff. Um, then you go upstairs and we have, if you haven't been over to adoption court, which is 1703, 1705 is the adoption waiting room. And Cook County is actually kind of unique because we're one of the few courtrooms in the entire country that actually has a waiting room attached to the courtroom and the window is in such a way so that like slightly older kids can actually look in the courtroom so that they, you know, in case they're nervous or something, they can actually see that it's not a scary place that they're going to be walking into. So it's kind of cool. And the playroom has, you know, toys, computers, um, things to keep the kids entertained while you're waiting for the kids to be called. Although the computers are not working so well lately because we've got a lot of smart kids that come through the uh, computer room and reprogram things. So it's kind of hard to, <laughs> kind of hard to keep those uh, working for everybody. But um, anyway, so what will happen is when your case is ready to be called, um, you'll, the clerk will call your last name and you'll step up to the front, to the bench. You'll hand the judge the packet of papers that you had for the judge. You'll hand your copies to the clerk and you can, um, if the judge hopefully has read everything you know ahead of time the judge may have a couple questions for you before the family comes in otherwise um the judge will look to the sheriff um in the courtroom and ask the sheriff to call your family by their last name the family will come in everybody will get sworn in um, they'll introduce your clients and the child to the judge you'll um, the judge will ask, i always tell my clients the judge will ask easy questions with easy answers you know nothing that they don't know the answer to so there's no reason for them to be nervous it's the you know hey how you doing how's school kind of variety of questions Hmm? Who fixed your hair? Yeah, who made your hair pretty? Um, <laughs> every judge is a little bit different, and uh, some of the judges are more talkative than others. There's at least one judge that pretty much will just smile and sign the papers and send you on your way. Um, but and if you do more of these, you'll get to know, you know, sort of if you want. If your clients, like I can, I now can tell my judges, my clients ahead of time. Okay, well, this is the judge thing today. These are the kinds of questions you're probably going to hear, um, just to make it a little bit easier for them in case they're nervous. But in any case, um, basically, you're in front of the judge for all of about two or three minutes. Um, they will sign the orders that you've given them. They will interact with the court, I mean, with the clients, and then they will send you on your way. And you'll get your stamped copies back from the clerk, and you'll give the copies of the you know, orders that you need to to your clients, and then your clients are pretty much done. They don't have to come back to court unless there is some type of problem down the road, which isn't likely on any of your cases. So that's pretty much the only time that they have to come to court. Um, and then from there, you pretty much sit tight and what they talk about is going to happen next. And then um, I'll wrap up at the end. Let me jump in real quick just to uh, kind of comment on uh, uh, our perspective of that first court date. Um, we often will have these other requests for relief, like motions to waive publication fee and motions to waive the background check fee. Um, we often have some unique uh, service issues. Uh, based on unknown parents or, or unknown locations of parents. And so before they invite the family in, that's when I take the time to go over all those things with the court. I don't spend my time with the family talking about those tedious legal issues. So when your case is called as the attorney, you will step up. And that's when I introduce the case and any unique issues and any motions I have to make sure that those get addressed. After I take care of all those legal issues, um, then they invite the family and then it's just kind of a, a chat um, and then the whole goal of your day or time in court that day is to leave with all those orders that you presented entered so you want to get them all done and, and then you're done with your initial presentation day. and your clients get to leave with lollipops which is always fun. yeah do you deal with any cases in juvenile court it sounds like all of your cases originate here no all of our cases well, the CVLS cases are not juvenile. The cases will originate here, but in some cases, the parents' rights may have been terminated or it may be an expedited transfer from juvenile court. 
so they may be families that were juvenile court involved but when when they come down here downtown to right. adoption court it's after, after the, the court already correct it's, but those are not the cbls cases yeah, yeah we don't we don't take cases where uh, dcfs is actively involved okay. terminates the rights yeah. and sends them to go get an adoption dcfs has a a panel, I think, still of attorneys, of attorneys that, that those cases go through. Now, you will find cases from time to time where uh, parents' rights have been impacted in DCFS, and maybe there's been a care plan, or somehow these kids have gotten into a, a relative's possession, and then the parents are gone, and no one's ever finished that case or terminated the rights, and they'll come to us. And so, a lot of times, our cases that we file will have this background DCFS activity, um, but it'll get found, it'll get reported. And it's not a problem. But those where there's been a termination and DCFS is wanting them to pursue an adoption, we don't do this. There was another question. Yeah. Um, going back to the biological parents of something, you were talking about the joint petitioner, right? We're talking no. About the other parents. Correct. Right. Yeah. No okay. step parent situation, this, the signature of the petitioner, okay. of the bio mom, for example, on the petition is enough. That's not, you don't have to separate consent. Okay. And the second question is what if the biological parent is outside of the country? How do you, I mean, obviously, oh. can't request <laughs> Oh, boy. <laughs> Maybe we could we leave could, that one to yeah. the end, or? Yeah, that's complicated. Yeah. yeah. Well, Is I, it? I think you just, you have to, sh they, can com they can consent as so long as in another country, so long as it complies with the laws of that country. And you have to bring in proof with the consent that, indeed, that consent was taken in compliance with the laws of where that person signed their consent. So if you read the, um, there is law about that, and you can re you can read it and comply with it because the court, most of the judges will hold you to the fact that that consent has to be in compliance with the laws of the country where that parent signed. Okay. So you have to do more work. Right. I was thinking more of like maybe an affidavit will be sufficient. No. 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 The the statute requires that you show that that consent is valid okay. in the place where that consent was taken. Or you can allege them to be unfit and serve them in their foreign country. Um, or you might not really know where they are uh, somewhere in that foreign country, but don't know where they are, and you would publish. So there's all those ways. The, the reason I said, and, and that's the, those are the answers, uh, the reason I said to talk about it at the end is because it's not so easy to know what the law of the foreign jurisdiction is, um, even if you can access it. Sometimes it's in different language. Sometimes uh, it's not clear what their consent method is. We have one right now with a parent in the Philippines willing to consent, and, and we're not sure they have a civil consent to adoption method. They don't. Well, okay, we couldn't find it, so we went another direction, but but it can be somewhat complex. And then also the same thing applies to parents that are in other states, too. You can take a consent, the person in another state can either sign a consent based on Illinois law, which would require it to be on in front of a judge in that other state, or they can sign a consent that's valid based on their state's rules. So a parent always has to come in if the parent, biological parent, is consenting to the adoption? Under Illinois law. Right. That's true. Can only consent before a judge. Well, no. No. There could be someone <laughs> appointed to take a consent. So there could be a social worker at the prison who can take the consent on that side and send it in. Or if somebody is sick, you can get somebody appointed to go to them and take a consent. Okay. And that would be in an initial presentment motion and order? Correct. Be. It would be a separate motion. Okay. All right. So I guess I will turn this over to Sharice. I was asked to speak about the role of the GAL and the role of the investigator. So just, just by way of background, that you're aware that the GAL is appointed for the minor because the minor is deemed legally incompetent. Uh, they don't have very good judgment to make these kinds of legal decisions. So the GAL is appointed in order to uh, inform the court or give a recommendation to the court as to the minors, what's in the minor's best interests. Um, now, best interests, I'm not sure in, I'm so used to dealing with best interests, I'm not sure if it's actually defined in the Adoption Act, I don't think it is, but it is defined in um, the Juvenile Court Act, which the Appellate Court says the Juvenile Court Act and the Adoption Act are to be read uh, in concert. So, you know, best interest and i hope this puts you at ease has a lot to do with the child's attachments and where that child's been living that child's identity their community 
um, their cultural and familial and religious ties. It has a lot to do with um, the time that they've actually spent with the petitioners on the types of cases that most of the CBLS cases involve. So best interest um, is usually going to cut it in the most 99% of the cases, ultimately it's going to cut in favor of um, the child remaining exactly where they've been. Um, <clears throat> minors, since they're incompetent, they cannot consent to the adoption unless they're 14 or over. So the GAL also, the attorney, the attorney for the, is an attorney, the GAL is an attorney, but we are not the attorney for the child. And that's a distinction that I'm not going to explain today, but we are not the attorney for the child. We don't have to do what the child tells us to do. We are appointed only as the GAL in those cases. Um, and as such, we will enter the consent. Our report does enter the consent of the minor to the adoption if they're under the age of 14. Um, and our biggest role when we're only acting as the GAL is to review the investigation to ensure that it's complete and accurate and more importantly sort of makes the rec a complete record for the court because the report of investigation is all that we have with respect to the best interest of the minor evaluating and ensuring that the home is safe and that it serves the best interest of the minor to stay uh, in this home or to be adopted so if the on your cases if you happen to get i mean i can see you getting an agency case if the foster parent, if, if someone was previously worked with an agency uh, and they currently have a foster care license, but I don't know if they would meet you, I don't know what your income requirements are. There may be an agency that may, may be willing to do a report of investigation uh, for one of your clients because they're licensed and have a current background check. So if you've got an agency investigation, uh, usually most of the important ducks are in a row um, there will be some questions about the social aspects of the living situation, how the child came to live there, that the child's all their needs are being met. But the agencies pretty much know what has to be in a report of investigation, and those tend to go a lot more smoothly. Um, if you're, and that's in an unrelated adoption. And, and we do do unrelated we do some cases. Unrelated yeah, adoptions. And that's the difference in the, the case type is the investigation. So if you have an unrelated adoption and there's no possibility of having an agency do your report of investigation, the Office of Adoption and Child Custody, formerly Social Services of the Circuit Court, will conduct that investigation. I'm not going to, um, you have to contact them. There's a sliding scale. They can come out and do an investigation. Your it will take much longer period of time to have them complete an investigation. But they will make one or two home visits, request me medical documents, suppose they check divorce decrees, get a birth certificate, find out a little bit about how the child came to live there and sort of do a bit of a home study or a home assessment. Um, that's going to take a long time. The GAL will review it. Um, I don't usually ask for a lot of additions to those because it's already taken such a tremendous a long time to get them um, unless there's some significant gaps like how the child came to live there and they're unrelated you know who made this placement of the child there in the beginning I mean unless there's just something in the investigation that raises another question that I think is important for the court to know um a lot of the c i have not actually been in jail for a lot of cbl cases maybe about five or six at the most um the gal has been appointed the investigator because it is a related adoption um all of those have gone to judgment um and you'll need sort of three major pieces your fingerprint based background check which you need state and FBI. You'll need your cants on the unrelated, well, on the non-biological, if it's not a biological parent or a legal parent, we'll need a cants. So if it's the grandparents, we need a cants for both. If it's a step-parent adoption, we'll need a cants for the step-parent. 
if it's a, a second parent adoption, we'll need a CANTS for the second parent. A CANTS is a child abuse and neglect tracking system check. So CANTS, C-A-N-T-S, is child abuse and neglect tracking system that is maintained by the Illinois Department of Children and Family Services. And we'll find out if there have been hotline reports that have been investigated and actually indicated. An indication means that there is some credible evidence that the child has been abused or neglected in some way. Um, I will also do a sex offender check on um, the petitioner or petitioners. Sometimes I'll do a sex offender check on the bio parents as well and the related if I have their names. I have had sex offenders who are the biological parents of the child. That does raise more questions. So I would think that hopefully you guys have already investigated that situation and are aware when um, there's a, there's a possibility of access or contact and be able to address those kinds of issues with the court. I will raise them. I've raised them on CBLS cases. Um, I'm about to raise it on a DCFS case. So uh, when dad is convicted of criminal sexual assault, it's especially if it's to a child under the age of 12, you're, you know, and that father is in the state two blocks away, you're gonna, we're gonna have to address it. Um, so those kind of, I think some things you can sort of prepare for if you would have questions if your child was going to have access to that person. So sort of don't sort of turn off the common sense on these things so that you can be prepared to answer any questions that may come up. You'll also need supporting affidavit, supporting documents for your affidavit. You need your affidavit of, for the investigator, both the petitioners each petitioner has to fill one out, whether there's one or two. Both petitioners or the sole petitioner must fill out an affidavit. Now, this is where you have issues. Your clients don't disclose criminal background hits. The jail gets the fingerprints. They're hits. <laughs> what do you do? You lie on the affidavit. They're going to say, I couldn't read, I forgot. Right, and they're going to want to amend. I will allow them to amend um, their affidavit to so reflect. Some judges want to know why you didn't disclose it. Um, and that's for you to work out with your client. I do not try not to, I just tell you to keep it short, but it needs to be to the point. So if there are hits, it's best to disclose them. I would suggest you interview your clients on this issue more than one time and ask them, please do not be offended by this question, but sometimes things happened a while ago and you just put it out of your mind. We really need to know this because this affidavit needs to be correct. And then you can just deal with it up front. Um, and it, it needs a sh very short explanation. I tell attorneys all the time, these hits are not barriers but you gotta disclose them. Um, they are not barriers to the adoption. You also, um, so supporting documents, I do request a birth certificate if you haven't already provided one to, because part of our job as the GAL, which I should have talked about, was to ensure that, your doc, that the court has terminated the parental rights. So I always like to see the birth certificate to ensure that we don't have a dad sitting on the birth certificate um, that we need to address. Um, so, and then in a, now that we have civil unions, both partners will be on the birth certificate, uh, which is a good thing. Um, and that way I can, I can see who the co-parent, who the co-parent is. Um, divorce judgments. If um, a petitioner is divorced, I do the general order requires that they submit their divorce judgment. The law in Illinois was that if you were married but not divorced, that both the spouses had to adopt. Because if you 
gave birth to a child and you were married, your husband would be the legal father and responsible for that child. So if you were married and you wanted to, you couldn't adopt as a single married person, both the couple had to adopt. Now there's, an, uh, the court allows a single married person to adopt so long as they have been living separate from their spouse for a year. So you have to provide the affidavit of separation which says that they've been living away from their spouse for a year or more, for a year. Then that married person can adopt as a single adoptive parent. Uh, that's another supporting document that you'll want to uh, provide to the investigator. And generally that has to be provided to the court anyway. So that's one of those documents that you would ordinarily submit to the court at the initial presentment in your packet. If not, the judge is going to include that on the, on the case management order for you to submit your affidavit of separation. I do not ask for proof of citizenship because I try to treat everyone the same. So I don't ask for it. I did have a case and it wouldn't have been a CBLS case, but it was um, the couple and like there were two sisters, one lived in the U.S., one lived in Pakistan, and the sister had the baby, and the sister in Pakistan had the baby for the sister in the U.S. So there was um, lots of documentation, lots of consents going back and forth, and um, the attorney provided proof of citizenship for the adoptive, for the her clients, the petitioners. Uh, because the the second half of the the, the, aunt, the sister and her husband were Pakistani nationals, and it just I wouldn't have asked for proof of citizenship for her uh, clients. But if you think there's ever a situation that gives rise to there may be a question that may be something you want to um, you want to submit, but I wouldn't ask for it. But I think. That's something you might want to think of. And her being proactive and submitting everything made that just, you know, this person gives you everything anyway. So it just flew. I mean, I could sit down in one night. It took me an hour to go over it all, but it was perfect. No questions. Got it. Shipped it off. Her report was in two weeks in advance. Um, so if there, that's one way in which you can ensure that things go smoothly if you provide, you know, you try to, um, think of what may be some questions or some issues that will come up. What the GAL is not, we no longer pre-screen. I probably just got in big trouble. Somebody told me that it was my job to proof their stuff when they had the minor adopting the petitioner, the minor adopting the grandmother. Oh. They said that's what we pay you for to catch that. Those big bucks, though. Yeah, I think mean, $25. So, um, needless to say, that didn't go over well with me. Um, so, <clears throat> if I catch a mistake on something, I will definitely leave you a voicemail and tell you that I saw a typo, you know, <laughs> some kind of mistake on your judgment order. Um, where to get, I need notice of the, of course, we need notice of your judgment order and your motion for entry of judgment when the case is ready. You should, you know, file that and notice us on it. Um, that's not where I spend a lot of my time looking over your judgment orders. You make sure your judgment orders are um, what they need to be. ICL has good samples as well to use. So I may not catch if the birth date is wrong or the, mis the new name is not spelled exactly right. Um, and um, so things will, things will get through. Um, you know, mistakes will get through. Um, we are there to um, answer any questions that we can. Uh, I don't give out samples because most of the samples I have are not my work. So I direct the attorneys to ICL. I would suggest you read the general order, and I'd also suggest that you read the statute. Um, the adoption court seems to have, it, it seems in the past it's been a, just a culture. Most of the rules were based upon the culture and things that have come into being because there was absolutely no contest. 
And so a culture developed in how things were done, which may have mirrored the statute, may not have mirrored the statute, but that's how it was done. So things are changing, and you want to make sure that if you're questioned about it, you know it, what the Adoption Act says about it, even though you've been told what the culture is on this specific issue of when and when you cannot get an interim order. You know, you won't, an interim order won't be so important if your client has legal custody. If your client doesn't have legal custody and somebody walks in, if the mom walks in and says, I know how to get rid of this, give me my kid back, you're going to want to, you need an interim order. So um, I think those are issues that you have to read that the adoption court is trying to move into how the rest of the circuit court operates. So if you've, if you've sort of operated in other areas, you practice law, you'll know you need to get your motions filed. You need to provide notice to all the parties, you know, which is just the GAL and the courtesy copy to the judge, but they are becoming a little bit more um, procedurally focused in sort of how the rest of the circuit court uh, operates. I think if you do that, you'll be fine. And um, when in doubt, pick up the phone and ask, and I'll try not to be grumpy. Oh. <laughs> Tracy, that's <clears throat> no, that's not right now. <laughs> you're not on the other end of the phone. Yeah. You're on the other end of the oh, email. Yeah. yeah. The Hague Convention. Yes. <laughs> so I, I had a judge ask me if a petitioner who was uh, married to the biological mother wanted to adopt the child as his own. We're lawfully present in the Hague Convention. That's not a Hague Convention. That's not a Convention. I didn't think it was, but then what do you do? Can a judge, the judge can ask that I would assume. Well, I would assume that the judge can ask it, and I think you have to be careful in how you answer it. I mean, I think you have, is the person's documented or not documented. Um, the, the Adoption Act, I do not believe, requires that they be documented. Um, so you have to kind of, I don't think we have those issues anymore. Well, the judge really said she had to make sure that this parent, well, step parent, would have been step parent, well, who wanted to adopt, who was not deported and could take the child with him. But there will be two parents, stage. right? Right. Well, that creates an issue, too, when you've now given the rights to a deportable person yeah. and share the rights for, for a potential custody case. You know, uh, we used to not have a problem with uh, undocumented cases, and neither did the court. Uh, there was a time uh, several years back where the affidavit of investigator was changed a bit to ask for a Social Security number, mm -hmm. and that sent ripples uh, on the issue, uh, I think, oh, yeah. through the court and what we were going to do with these cases. We don't generally take undocumented cases anymore because that ripple really hasn't changed to us enough yet. And even if it has, the issue can come up and then you can't lie. So then you're, you're potentially stuck having to make the statement about your status to a court personnel. And then the judge still is going to potentially think that we have an adopter who's deportable. Is that in the child's best interest? So I still think it's a bit of an issue. So we, we've not really changed our policy lately. But then we have to ask the client. Oh yeah, you do. If the client is lawfully present or documented. The, and then, the Adoption Act says that it has to be a resident. We can ask it to everyone then. Uh, are we a mandatory reporter? No, you don't have to report it to the INS. I mean, that's the other but you know as i think that as a reasonable making your signing your affidavit i mean signing the petition um that you know you do have some requirement to make a reasonable investigation i mean i would sort of raise it as a best interest issue i mean i know i've had in juvenile court judges pull kids but we had another aunt who was documented and so it didn't matter um but there is an issue of if this child, if this person is forced to leave the country, um, what's going to happen to the child who is a citizen? Um, so that's something that you've got to work out and consult with your experts about. The Adoption Act requires that the, the adopting parties be resident, and some people, some judges, will read that to mean legally resident. And I think that's where it comes in. 
<clears throat> Were you going to do section five? Well, we which isn't on section. We haven't finished four. Oh, I, I was told that I was told that I was assigned four because I am the GAL on the longest termination of parental rights case <laughs> ever in the history <laughs> of the world, and we finished our closing arguments this morning. Um, but um, this is. Uh, this is why nobody can earn a living being a GAL. We have to uh, have other ways to support ourselves. This is uh, a, a case that started <coughs> two and a half years ago, and we're expecting a decision tomorrow. And, um, yeah, it's it's been interesting. Um, jurisdiction is the first thing. The parties must have the court must have legal jurisdiction, and jurisdiction is stated in the statute, so you can you can look at that very easily. Um, the adoption court is the county division is the court with jurisdiction over adoptions and um, it's um, <coughs> it's not so much a venue issue we get a lot of adoptions from other counties in Cook County uh, one reason is that we were doing same-sex adoptions long time before many of the other counties were. Many of them still are not in spite of the Civil Union Act. So we get a lot of adoptions here that come from other counties. So if you happen to have a case, and CBLS you probably won't, but if you happen to have a case where it, it, it's a different venue issue, nobody really raises that here. The other reason is that they, they were thinking of raising it when they had more adoptions pending here, and now the numbers are so far down that uh, <coughs> nobody is really nobody is overloaded. So that okay, we're under. So uh, I don't think anybody's going to raise the the venue issue. Uh, termination of parental rights. You have to have jurisdiction over the parents before you can terminate parental rights. I think Phil did a good job of explaining how you find the parents. Um, military affidavits are something you want to look at. You have to be able to show that the, the missing parent, regardless whether it's the mother or the father, is not in the military. So if you have a, a parent that you can't locate, um, you need a military affidavit. Um, and you need to state what search you have done or how you know that that person is not in the military. I had one the other day that uh, just simply said he was born in Guatemala. And I said, that won't do it. There are plenty of people who are born in Guatemala who are in the armed forces in the United States. So that's not enough. You have to have back it up. He's 83 years old, or you know, he died two years ago. That wouldn't be a moment. Yeah. But uh, you know, he's he's uh, he's uh, seriously physically handicapped. Or we search the military locator base. Uh, there is a military locator base, and if you know. Uh, birth date, name, etc. You can a social security number. As I say, they date. just changed it. Now you, you have, have to have, have, have the social. social. Which they didn't um, used to have. And and you'll find that you have a lot of women who don't. You know, were married 20 years to the guy and can't find a record of his social, um, or weren't married and don't know the social. So very often you'll say that you weren't able to find anything on the military locator, but you might be able to ask a relative if if someone knows a relative. You call the guy's mother and say, you know, where's your son? Um, she may say, I don't know, and you'll say, did he join the military? No. Or there may be some physical or lifestyle factors that you know would keep him out of the military, and, and that would work. Um, service issues, you have to have, uh, first of all, you have to serve serve the parents, and I think Phil did a good job of that, so I'm going to skip it. Uh, you, if you, if you are stating that you have served the parents or you tried to serve the parent and you couldn't find them you need an affidavit of due diligence and you really need to say what i did you don't want to say we looked everywhere for him and couldn't find him you want to say you checked facebook myspace white pages um you called every living relative i had a case uh, about two years ago where they swore that they couldn't find him, had no idea where he was. And so I did what I always do. I Googled the guy's name. It was a very unusual name. Up popped 12 pages of MySpace that the guy had out there. It, and it had pictures of him and it, it had information about the son that they were trying to, you know, trying to adopt. And um, it actually had the number of the trailer in the trailer park with the address where he lived in Blue Isle. 
So, and, and four relatives. It was a very unusual name. So, if, you know, if you have four relatives, if there's four other people with the same last name in a small town, they probably know where to find it. Uh, so, it, you really have to give a lot. The judges won't let it go with just, we don't know where he is. Um, I, I get some that say, well, he moved to Mexico and no one's ever been able to find him. But, you know, did you know any relatives? Do you know any cousins? Uh, who have you called? What have you, what have you tried to do to find him? Um, let me so, add yeah. a little perspective uh, from us, which is that uh, we have a lot of these. I mean, we have a lot of cases. <laughs> Most of, of our cases that will have publication on one or the other parent. Um, and we were having a very difficult time on these due diligence affidavits. And I think now in the digital age, it's almost impossible to say, you know, I can't find them. You've got to come up with some information to explain why you can't find them. I find now, though, the difficulty, because what we did in that response is went ahead and purchased a, a people finder service through Lexis, which is really effective. If you take a CBLS case, um, you have access to that. Um, but now we're finding people. <laughs> but we otherwise could have said we can't find them. Um, so it's it's requiring more service attempts, um, and you're going to end up finding people. Now where I find the problem, though, uh, is on common names with no Social Security number. And it's going to always remain a, a problem. So if I've got Bob Smith or Robert Smith uh, as the, bi the biological father who I have to serve, and I don't have a Social Security number, I, I don't know the answer to that question. To me, it's probably going to rely more on your contact and communication with friends and family members and uh, acquaintances and people who know them than it will on your digital searches for this person. But if I've got a unique name or I've got a social security number, I, I'm going to have to show what I've done uh, online and digitally to find this person because you will find them. It's almost impossible to be off the grid now. Um, so it's those those common names with no social security number that are still going to be right. difficult. You'll get an address. You may not be able to locate them there, but you'll get yeah. an address. Yeah, and, and you want then you can try service if you have the fun so. starts. <laughs> yeah, it, then the, then the fun starts. Um, in in fact, in the case that I just finished this morning, that's been going on two and a half years, uh, one issue was that we did Google and we did find a whole bunch of stuff, and so then the biological <coughs> mother, whose rights are hopefully being terminated, um, her uh, attorney accused us of cyber stalking. So. <laughs> okay, thank you. I don't use cyber stock anymore. Yeah, yeah. But anyhow, and not only that, I am not capable. She accused me, and, and I guarantee I would oh. not be capable of cyber <laughs> I don't know, Nancy. Yeah. Okay, Google I can do. Okay, um, but you, you need all these service issues. Uh, consent, there are two types of consents, the general and the specific consent. Um, a general consent is when a mother or someone signs off it and gives consent to an agency for a, a child to be adopted or when it, uh, for instance, in a uh, uh, case where the biological parent comes in and gives a consent, it may not be to a specific person. There is also the possibility of a specific consent where um, I consent to have Jeannie adopt my children, which wouldn't work. Um, but, um, and then if anything happens and Jeannie can't adopt, then you have other issues, but this consent becomes uh, invalid. Um, the other is consent of minors. A child over 14 has to give consent to an adoption, and the GAL also gives consent. So it, it's a dual consent from 14 to 18. And other than that, um, children under that age will not give consent, but the judge will usually ask them a question, something like, you know, are you, you know, what does your mommy do to make you happy? Are you going to, this, is this your forever mommy forever? And what do you call her? Something so that they know that the child is actually um, comfortable in, in the uh, family. Um, we, you went through the legal father and putative father registry. That I, my favorite putative father registry story is that occasionally you will get a printout from the clerk's office that calls it a punitive father registry. <laughs> <laughs> putative father registry. Um, we get a lot of those, but it's it's uh, the registry through DCFS. If you just type in Illinois putative father, it comes up, and you have to um, check on that to make sure you 
and you have a waiver on the fees, We do. Right? If you don't have a legal father, then you always have to check that putative yeah. father registry to see if someone has signed up to be yeah. uh, considered the legal father. Unique to CVLS, though, is that we have an agreement with the, the putative father registry to do these searches for free. Um, so if you take a CVLS case, just know that you can come to me, get some information on how to do that, and your, your registry search will be free. I think it's $40. That's $40. Yeah. 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 And um, that makes a, just a huge difference. Um, number five, post-filing procedure. We're, we're I'm going to... Uh, so can I go real fast? Uh, Probably, but I'm just going to let people know that our seminars are an hour. Our CLE certification is for an hour. Um, it's it's over. No if you're all happy to stay, um, <laughs> we'll probably finish up because I think we can do Pretty it quick. Pretty fast, but you need to know about that. But if you have to go, over. feel free to take a uh, certification and, and the subsequent case management orders. Once you have your case management order, you've set the date for finalization. Something happens, you need a subsequent case management order. You can get them online, you can get them from Phil, you can get them from your GAL, you can you can get them all sorts of places, but you, you need to submit it. You can submit, if you call your GAL and get it by agreement, you can submit it without anything. Just, you don't need a motion even appearance. if it's agreement. And you don't have to have an appearance, you can actually fax it in, you, email it You can it fax in. it, you can email it, whatever, and it gets ordered automatically. So suppose, um, you have a case and uh, there's there's something that's missing that the fingerprints haven't come back the cans didn't come back whatever uh, you're you're missing service on somebody and you know you need two more weeks um, you can call the GAL and say is it okay if I take two more weeks it is you just get it to Gloria in 1701 um, and that's that's agreed and you don't need to do anything about it it happens all the time it ha it's common don't feel that that you should try to avoid it, because I'd say half our cases get subsequent case management orders at some point or another. Um, motions, if you're filing a motion for anything, you've got to file it as a motion. This is real court. This is, <laughs> it's, it's no longer where you just go in and somebody goes through your paperwork. This is real court. You want a notice of motion, you notice up everybody, uh, and you can, if you, really got something that doesn't qualify as an emergency but you need to get it done you call the GAL and say we waive the notice otherwise you've got a notice factor there just as you would in any other court um, there's some things for which the GAL will come in for your arguments there are some things for which the GAL will not and I get a lot of motions that that are presented as motions when they could be agreed when call your GAL and say is this okay because if your GAL is willing to agree, it makes it a lot easier and the judge will just sign it. Um, those, those things would be motions for, um, well, waiver of something. Uh, you may not get it as agreed, but you can certainly put in your, in your motion that I've spoken to the GAL and the GAL is in agreement with this. Don't ever put it in if you didn't speak to one of us. <laughs> we will not be happy. Um, and then uh, motions for default and motions for entry of judgment. Those are two separate motions. Many people uh, will put them in for the same day. I think the GALs all prefer that you you do the default as soon as you are able to get the default. And the court actually prefers and that the court it be prefer, prefers it. Um, you are supposed to have the motion for default entered two weeks before the motion for entry for judgment. And, and that's because you're supposed to get everything to us two weeks before the, the date of the entry motion for entry for judgment. You get everything to us and you get everything to the court, courtesy copies to the court two weeks ahead of time and it, it's 14 days. Um, just in case you wondered because most people can't count that two mm -hmm. weeks ahead of time is 14 days. But we should have them two weeks ahead of time. Um, in order to do that we need to know that the parent has been defaulted. We can't write our report. Which there's a paragraph in there where we say how the parental rights were terminated. We don't know because if you put it the same day, the default the same day as the judgment, we can't write a report. We don't know that that's what's remaining. So do your motion for default as soon as you've met the requirements that are necessary. Don't wait for the OACCA report. Don't wait for us. Don't wait for the fingerprints. Get that default. The other reason is get the default because the parent is taken care of and you don't have to worry that you know a week later the parent
parent's going to show up and then there's an issue of, well, maybe it's only a week, so maybe the parent is still there and you end up in a contested case. So get that done. But get the motion for default done. Get a copy of the default order. Send it to us with your motion for entry of judgment. And make sure that it's two weeks ahead because we really do need that time. Uh, very often we can do it faster, but very often we can't. For instance, I got one this morning for Friday. Well, I was running to court this morning. First of all, I have to have my report in five days ahead or a week ahead, depending which which person you ask. Um, but we're supposed to have our reports in a week ahead. Well, I can't do that, obviously, if I got it today. And the other is, I may be crunched for those particular two days. You know, I had closing arguments today. I came right here, going back tomorrow for the, uh, the uh, ruling and I may not have a minute to get that report done between today and Friday. And so give your GAL uh, as much time as you guys are going to have. Yeah, give us a break. Um, call the GAL if, if you're in a crunch and, and it, the timeline is tight. Call the GAL and say, can you do it? You know, are you in time and do you have the time? Nancy, yeah. you, know, just, you know what I forgot? Well, one thing that we forgot about if there are more than one child to be adopted. Oh, yeah. Did they want you to do the petition in counts? Yeah. And um, yeah, that's new. And so I got one yeah. where um, yeah. only sons, only there was sons. a minor and an adult adoption on one petition, and they didn't call them minors or adults. He called them something else. Respond, I don't know, responded something. Yeah. The, so then when I caught it was an adult, you know, I had to scramble to meet the adult, the disabled adult, who was being adopted. So if you put your petition in counts for each child, and that's the new requirement that you do it, is it a requirement? Or I, not? I, I don't think that. it's a requirement, but oh, it sure so makes it helpful. neat and clean. It makes it, it, makes much it a neater lot neater and, neater and cleaner. cleaner. Yeah. And, um, and it does also because you will often have a potential different parent, right. same parent for yeah, some, a different that, parent, right. um, and it yeah. cleans that up. And, and then we can write our report as to such and such a child, as to such and such another. Otherwise, we're writing the, the, the rights of the you know, mother were terminated, the rights of this father, the rights of this father. So it, it makes it a lot easier for our reports, too, and makes it so the judge can follow it. And the other is that occasionally there's a situation, if you have children with separate fathers, you may be able to proceed with the adoption with one and have to hold off on the other. And if you have it separated out like that, and there may be a good reason if you're dealing with in some cases an immigration issue if you're dealing with getting the kid's birth certificate before he starts high school, which kids really care about, um, things like that, you may want to finish the adoption of the older child even if the younger child's father's service hasn't been completed because we can't find him. Um, and, and your Philippines case would be a good example. It's, it's very hard getting service done in the Philippines. The other thing I thought about, which I think affects the CVLS program, are older caregivers. Because I oh, think yes. everyone I've had has been an older caregiver. Um, you may want to ask your GAL, how does this judge feel about older caregivers? Um, some judges will be much more suspicious that it is a Social Security issue that's being done mm -hmm. for financial reasons. That this, you know, 65-year-old person is adopting a three-year-old grandchild. So those are issues that you may run into and you may want to think about and brainstorm and talk to your client about what's going so that you have some explanation uh, about why they're doing this adoption now. Um, so and their ability to actually care for the child and think about another loss for that kid if that if now their adopted mother, you know, dies when they're 14 or 15. Or is otherwise incapacitated. Right. right. You know. But you can also address that by doing a standby adoption you can do or a stand other by or a, a back, back standby guardianship or other backup plan. So those is, are things that you need to have the family needs to consider when you have an older caregiver is who's going to step in uh, and take care of the child. And I've had cases where it is the biological parent is the backup plan. Humorously, that's really what it is. Which then calls into question why you're doing the adoption anyway. So, so just, you guys need to just flush it out. That's what I'm just raising is going to come up. You guys need to have that flushed out before you come in. So uh, what she's saying is that if you are on Social Security and you adopt a child, you get an additional dependency benefit for that child. 
uh, it throws up a red flag for our organization and for us. And, and what we usually see for those cases is when you have that uh, a senior wanting to adopt on Social Security and moms, and, and it's the maternal grandmother, and mom's still around, mom's willing to consent, mom's over a lot, that's when I say what's really going on here. If you have that same case uh, with maternal or paternal grandmother and, and dad's gone or mom's gone, I have less of a concern. But when it's the parents still hanging around and maybe is the backup caregiver, <laughs> then you got to wonder what's going on. And it's, it's not really necessarily line. an appropriate case. But they get to you know. Yeah. Um, we, we, oh, had a, the we had a whole list of uh, uh, issues we were going to address that might be unique. And we actually kind of fit most of them in. Um, and then we were going to open up for questions, and I'm still going to do that, but we're essentially done because I've kept you longer than uh, you probably intended. I want to do say one thing, and um, what I had up uh, and what hopefully might come up is our website. And on our website, we have every pleading you might need, every form you might need. Uh, we also have our manual, um, a standing order, uh, appendixes to the manual to talk about how to do the criminal background check, whether related or unrelated. We have pretty much everything. So if you are interested in an adoption case, uh, in addition to getting the case from us, you will have access to just about anything you need to get through that case, both procedurally and substantively. And then you have the relationship that we have with the GALs, um, which is not like it was good uh, necessarily. Um, but it's helpful. And in the old days, what Sharice was commenting on is adoptions just kind of got done with the help of the GAL. You would handwrite things on everything, and they just got done. Now it's much more formal, but it's also you have uh, expectations now. You know how it's going to proceed. Um, and so every bit of help you might need for an adoption is on our website, uh, and then the GALs are, are able to assist when it's appropriate. And I think I'll, I'll make a comment on that. The GAL cannot tell you how to do an adoption because it's a conflict of interest, obviously. We represent the child being adopted. But I think for CBLS cases, we are more willing to guide. Would be, you know, we'll answer questions. We can't tell you, here's what you should do or here's how to. But we can certainly say, well, you're missing so and so. Call Phil and ask him where it is. <laughs> Okay, so I thank you all for coming, and I thank our GALs for coming and talking to us. And if you have any questions, uh, come on up and oh, excuse me. let us know. Did you lose your umbrella? Oh, I did. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Even though it's a nice one, I would like to steal it off. I'll bring it out back. Okay. And then I was going to say one other thing, which is if anybody's, if anybody's interested in an adoption case, let me know. And, um,